Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So how many rock hounds do we have in the congregation? Anybody collect rocks, like rocks, have rocks for brains, anything <laughs> like that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that opens it up quite significantly. Uh, yeah, I, when I was a kid, especially, I, I was a rock hound. I was really uh, into it. I had um, actually sold, uh, oh, I collected aluminum cans and newspapers from my neighbors and sold them to the recycling center so I could get my own rock saw. Um, and I went out on these little expeditions to find precious stones, and, and my father and I actually found this to be a hobby we could um, we enjoyed together. So it's kind of a, a father-son bonding thing as well. And uh, once we joined a, a rock club, actually, and, uh, and for a while, and it went on to an expedition, kind of, so to speak, to a, 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 an abandoned mine, an abandoned gold mine, high up in the Cascade Mountains of the Pacific Northwest. This isn't the actual mine, but it looks like the one that we went to. We, I was very greatly excited to, to see this mine. I'd never been to a, a mine, and then it was kind of disappointing when I got there. It's like it was, the entrance was blocked off, and it's like, well, not much to see here. Uh, but I started then picking around through the, the gravel around. The, they had a lot of quartz gravel, this kind of ore-laden laden to gravel. And so I was looking around, and much to my utter amazement, I found a big hunk of quartz with golds just all over it. And I was just, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I went up to the leader of, the, of the, 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 the trip, and I said, my lucky day. He looked at it, said, uh, son, I hate to tell you this, but that's iron pyrite. Fool's gold. Well, I didn't have to ask where they got the name Fool's Gold <laughs> from. Shoot. Well, you know, the search for truth is a lot like the search for gold in the sense that sometimes what seems brilliant and valuable is really kind of worthless. And yet, unlike gold prospecting, we don't really have an objective standard of ultimate authority by which we can base, you know, tr claims of truth or test claims of truth against. Uh, now, now, many Christians actually would say, no, that's, you're wrong. You know, we do have an ultimate source of truth by which we can gauge uh, truth claims, and that is uh, the, the Bible. It's not maybe uh, gold, but it's uh, written in black and white. God's Word, inerrant and literal, is uh, that objective standard by which we can base uh, we can, you know, what's valuable and what's the equivalent of fool's gold. Yeah. But was the Bible really meant to operate that way? As some thing we can just simply kind of dump a question into and it spits us out this you know, inerrant uh, truth that in, in response. Was that really why they created Scripture to begin with? Um, you know, interesting note that there was no Bible. There was no uh, recognized Bible for over 300 years uh, in the Christian era. You know, I mean, did they not hear God's Word you know, before then? I mean, how did they ever get along? Yeah. What did they create the Bible for anyway? You know, since we're in week five of a series about listening for God's voice, we thought, you know, it might be a good idea to pause for a moment and ask ourselves, how does the Word of God come to us for, for Scripture? How do we hear the voice of God uh, in Scripture? Well, the whole enterprise of finding books to go into what we call the Bible or the canon, the canon simply means normative you know, group of, 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 of material, the canon of Scripture, um, it actually uh, was brought about through a major controversy that happened uh, through this guy, Marcion, in the second century. Um, Marcion was a wealthy shipper and the son of a prominent bishop and he really thought we had a problem on our hands, uh, that there was too much diversity in Christianity, too many ways of thinking you, know, you could be a Christian, and too many weird thoughts about what that meant, how we work our relationship with God out. Um, and he thought that a lot of that kind of weirdness and diversity, the, 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 the grossness of the, the diversity was caused because we have a lot of texts that really went off in all kinds of different directions. So we really felt that we need to have one standardized body of literature that, by which you can say, okay, this is Christian and the rest you know, uh, isn't. And to be sure, Marcion had a point. There was some rather weird stuff out there. In the hundred years since Jesus had walked the, 
the earth, um, there were um, not just you know, four Gospels created like we know, but there were um, many, many, many others uh, uh, created as well as letters and epistles and, and, and so forth. Um, one of those Gospels, for instance, uh, the, uh, was called the Gospel of Peter, and the author um, claimed to be Peter himself. Now, scholars now date the authorship of this to the latter half of the second century, so probably not Peter, uh, but also there was some rather strange stuff in this gospel of Peter. Uh, for instance, um, uh, there's this uh, uh, Christ's cross was said to have levitated from his tomb and began talking with people. Yeah. And Marcy didn't think that that should be in the Bible, and likely neither would you or I. Right? There was also, uh, for instance, the infancy gospel of, of uh, Thomas, this was uh, somebody's attempt, also likely written in the second half of the second century, but claiming earlier authorship, was an attempt to fill in all that, that, that space between Jesus' birth and when we find him in Luke when he's 12 year, years old in the temple. You know, there's all this, this gap. What happened for 12 years? Well, the gospel, infancy gospel of Thomas tried to fill that um, and with stories of, of a precocious Christ child who could um, blow into a clay bird and it would become a real bird who could also, though, utter a curse at, at a kid who was picking on him and it would strike him dead and his parents blind. You know, probably not the stuff we want to have in our, in our Bible. So Marcion certainly had a, had a point. But the problem was is Marcion himself had some rather strange ideas about Christianity and that might have been a bit more like fool's gold than, than real gold. For instance, Marcion was rabidly anti-Semitic. He felt like the God of the Old Testament <coughs> excuse me, um, was a, a horrible God, um, evil even, primitive, evil, um, and he wanted nothing to do with it. He felt that that God was the, an, the antithesis of the God uh, of Jesus. And so his, the, the, the Bible that he proposed had no, none of the Hebrew Scriptures in it at all. He also felt that amongst the Christian writings, um, again, there was too much diversity, but, he, um, but even like the Gospels that we know that were actually quite popular, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he thought, you know, there are too many contradictions in them. We, you know, that's going to lead to all kinds of you know, short circuits, and, and so we need one Gospel only. He picked the Gospel of Luke, and then, we only, and then a few of the letters of Paul, about ten of those. And, but those he even edited because he felt like there's too many positive references to Jewish people and to the Jewish God in here. They must be obviously corruptions to the text. So he edited all that out too. He said, here's the Bible. Here's what we ought to have as normative canon. Well, happily, most of Christendom uh, recoiled in horror <laughs> over that, uh, but it got people thinking, like, maybe we ought to attend to this. Maybe we ought to uh, ask ourselves, take this time to, to pause and, and, and ask, what is sacred? What are, are there texts that really truly could be considered um, sacred among us? And they thought, we better engage in this if for no other reason so that a Bible like Marcion's doesn't, <laughs> doesn't appear, you know, as the normative thing. So, um, consequently, um, that started a two- hundred-year process, a 200-year process of, of searching and of discussion and debate and so forth and kind of weighing these things, things out uh, before we come to uh, anything that we could call a normative body of, that we would call Scripture the, um, that likely came about somewhere in the mid-fourth century uh, when Constantine asked for 50 copies of sacred Scripture to be written. That was probably right when the Bible was codified. Um, but even though that was a 200-year process, it actually, um, 20 of the 27 books of the New Testament were identified almost, well, immediately in large terms, within the first uh, two or three decades. Uh, about 20 of those books were so popular, so widely popular, that once they were, were proposed by a prominent leader, that, that 20 never went away. It always only added to, it never was uh, taken away from. So those, those books, in case you're curious, were uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Acts, 13 letters attributed to Paul, uh, and uh, 1 John and 1 Peter, and then the rest of the time was kind of weighing, confirming those and weighing others and, and, and trying to figure out which ones would go in. You may ask yourself, well, what basis, you know, what was the basis by which they chose these to begin with? And that's a curious thing, too. I mean, wh how would you choose uh, material? If you have this vast body of literature, what would say, make you say, okay, this is in and that's out? 
Well, one of the greatest historians in, in, in Christianity at the time, um, Eusebius, uh, tells us about that selection process. It's kind of interesting because he came out with his own list, which was very close to the 27 uh, in, the, in the New Testament. And his, he tells us his criteria, which is very similar to criteria used by, by others. There were really three criteria that Eusebius used, to paraphrase him, um, the first one was consensus. That is, um, across the history of Christianity, has there generally been a consensus that these books are, are good ones, are helpful? Are they regularly uh, um, cited by you know, the great you know, Christians of old and in, into our day as helpful? Uh, so consensus. The second one was proximity. You could say um, you know, proximity to Jesus, like was this written by someone who knew Jesus, or does it go back far enough to at least somebody who may have known somebody who knew Jesus? So early literature in that formative time um, did it come from that that era? So there were books that they thought were you know really wonderful, but it didn't go back to that era. They wanted to find uh, books that were had had that that not only that age, but also that longevity that of, of affirmation. And then the third criteria he used uh, was continuity. That is, does it is it generally continuous with what has been assumed to be Christian theology uh, in, in, you know, over, over time? Or, or is it just going to be way out here as an anomaly? Is it generally, does it comport well with Christian theology that's affirmed throughout the ages? Those were his three criteria. Now, what's particularly interesting to me about that list is not what's on it. They all make sense. But what's not on it? For instance, um, there is no um, criterion that asks, is this divinely inspired as the literal inerrant word of God? Nobody asked that question in that day. Now, given the amount of you know, fervor about biblical literacy, uh, inerrancy and, 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 and literalness these days, you'd think that that would have been the only criteria they used back then. But they did not share the modern notion of, of, of how inspiration works. Uh, not, not by a long shot. It's not that they didn't think you know, that these texts were inspired. It's actually thought there was lots and lots and lots and lots of inspired texts. And, but yet even with the, because there's a lot of inspired texts didn't mean that it would make it into the Bible. As uh, the New Testament historian uh, uh, Roy Hoover has noted, you know, the reason for this is apparently that since all Christians were filled with the Spirit, a claim of inspiration would not have been useful as a way of distinguishing canonical and extra-canonical, that is, outside the Bible, uh, Christian uh, writings. You know, in their opinion, um, you know, basically, you know, you could, uh, the, the Word of God comes, you could, it could be reflected in Scripture, but not found in Scripture. That is, you could detect someone who is likely in communi communion with God and who is hearing from the Holy Spirit in Scripture, but in t what, the second you say, okay, what is the Scripture saying to me, that involves a different process. That involves a process that can only actually happen in conversation with the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit speaking through this writing to, uh, to you? The, the Word of God could not be found simply on a page, written on a page, but rather it's written in the human heart. And so you could try to, they tried to distinguish between just plain fool, foolishness in text, what just didn't seem to have, you know, any helpfulness. But then, uh, you know, it, 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 they ruled out a lot of the bright, shiny stuff like, you know, gospels with talking crosses and, 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 and curses that killed people that Jesus uttered, things like this. Um, and then they found things that maybe have been less shiny, but, but like that genuine piece of gold-bearing ore up there had the streaks, you know, the, the marks of something genuine and real and something that would not deliver the Word of God to us, but rather would point us in the direction you know, of where God could be found, orient us towards uh, God. So really the whole process of finding these Scriptures could be likened to that that gold mining or prospecting process where, you know, they, they spent a good couple centuries kind of digging the quarries, you know, where they, they thought the material was. And then, you know, from that they got, you know, gold-bearing ore and they got the, the fool's gold and they had to separate that out. They took time to do that. But then once they got the gold-bearing ore, they were asking, well, you know, what's the heaviest? What's got the most, you know, the highest concentration of, of ore in there? And that's uh, what made it into our, our present Bible, that, that, that what kind of rose to the surface as being that, that most concentrated 
stuff. But even then, I mean, you can't, you know, if you have a, a book of the Bible or a rock of ore in your hand like that, it, it, that's not pure gold, is it? Um, but that's where they left the process. That's what the Bible represents. It's, it's ore-bearing uh, material. But the way they felt you got the pure gold from it was not how you read it. You know, it has nothing to do with being on a page. Again, it had to do with in the heart, you, if you're going to, to take that gold ore um, and get the, the pure stuff out of it um, using ancient techniques, you would have to apply heat to it. And so, you know, you'd have to put it in something that looks like this, in a you know, crucible, and, and put that in, and you apply this heat, and then the, the, the gold comes to the top, and you can pour that out, and the rock remains behind. And so they, they, they then, then, over time, developed techniques for heating up in a sense, the ore of Scripture so that the, the gold would come into our hearts. Now, one of those techniques they used, which is that goes all the way back to the era of when they were even selecting these Scriptures, um, is one that's known as Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina, or Lexio Divina, depending on which form of Latin you speak, um, is, um, a, is the longest continuously used practice for extracting the ore of Scripture, the, the, the gold of Scripture, out that we have. It's not the only practice, but it's just simply one practice, and it's the oldest. It goes clear back to um, a guy named Origen in the set, who lived in the 2nd and 3rd century, and then it was popularized by St. Benedict, who fo founded the Benedictine monastic movement. We have a Benedictine monastery in Schuyler. That's the same tradition. Those guys were really responsible for putting Lectio Divina uh, on the Christian map, and it's been used continuously ever since, primarily especially in the Catholic Church. But interestingly enough, in recent decades, um, Lectio Divina has been um, taken up again um, in, in the modern world, and especially by people you wouldn't necessarily expect, people in their 20s and 30s who grew up in the evangelical church who did grow up with biblical inerrancy uh, and literalness, who, who come to say that that's not working for us anymore, but simply looking then, well, how do you then find the Word of God in Scripture and discovering this ancient practice again and taking it up in their own communities? Well, we're going to um, uh, not simply talk about the process of Lexio Divina for the remainder of our time this morning. We're actually going to experience that. We're going to invite you to uh, experience Lexio Divina and perhaps then take this into your week. Um, we have given you every week these little prayer cards, and if you didn't get one, there's one out on the um, information station just with your name on it. It's written in invisible ink, but it does have your name on it. And uh, this week what we did was we put the fourfold process of Lexio Divina in the prayer card so you don't have to remember all this from uh, this morning. And just a little bit of, of notation about what, what they what those practices are, so perhaps you'll find some scripture to do this with and apply the heat in your own uh, prayer time uh, this week. But there are four movements, um, Lexio, Meditatio, Oratio, and Contemplatio, and I'll describe them as we get, get into them. But before we even start, what we want to do is take out our picks, our internal picks, and prepare uh, the, the terrain. What we want to do is take um, some time as music plays and simply um, prepare yourself to encounter um, the, a text, Psalm 46, and encounter, hopefully, uh, the Spirit of God uh, in that text. And you may want to, as a way of preparing yourself, um, think of a question that is important to you right now, that's specific to you and is important to you, it's so, and important enough that you may remember this for the rest of the week. Maybe it's your pledge, or maybe it's a, about a relationship, or what have you, or a job uh, situation, what have you. Find that, that, that question, and, and you may want to just kind of hold that loosely as we experience uh, Psalm 46, but let's first prepare our hearts. Be still. Shame, be still and 
to apply some heat. Uh, we're going to hear Psalm 46 read, and what you're going to, you're going to hear a couple verses at a time, and then it'll come up on the screen. You'll read it, so we'll have a couple different ways of interacting with the text. And as you experience the text, um, just pay attention to your internal self. What kind of stirs, what verse or, or, or phrase uh, stirs you the most in the reading? The object is, is to find one phrase, one verse, one word perhaps even, um, that stirs you. And don't try to overly to associate that with your questions. Just simply pay attention to what stirs you for whatever reason. Uh, and then we'll hear the whole thing read again and we'll experience this visually by simply indicating with our hands, show of hands, which when it gets to your verse, um, you know, where did it resonate? But first let us find that phrase or verse. <coughs> God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth to change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. God utters God's voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolation God has brought on the earth. God makes wars cease to the end of the earth. God breaks the bow 
and shatters the spear. God burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. As that passage is read again, just simply we're going to experience this visually too and simply lift your hand if that, when, when Tracy comes to the verse that contains the phrase or word or the verse that lifted itself off for you. God is our refuge and strength A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the high, holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. God utters God's voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations God has brought on the earth. God makes wars cease to the end of the earth. God breaks the bow and shatters the spear. God burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now, as we enter the second phase of this ancient process, the meditatio, simply hold on to that phrase or that word or that verse. And the object is, is not just to start thinking about your question, but simply think about everything in your life that touches that phrase or that you see out in the world that touches that phrase or that verse. 
We're going to take one minute and simply explore that as deeply as possible, every single direction you can come from, what speaks, and how does this it's a verse, where do you see it in life? The third phase, the oratio, is simply taking, now we'll take two minutes to simply now hold that question uh, next to the phrase. Or if you didn't have a question, or perhaps that phrase will suggest a different one that you hadn't thought of, but simply turn now, let's process that phrase and ask, how does it speak to you? We'll follow that when music stops with the last phase of lectio, which is simply dwelling in God's presence. When the music stops, simply let go of all that thought and we'll simply take two minutes in utter silence to simply dwell in the presence of God. <laughs> 